Hello, everyone. I'm here today with John Cape. I'm Stanley Smith, and John is very passionate about energy and the topic of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and uh, human activity and how it contributes to the, uh, the topic of global uh, change or extreme weather or global warming, whatever we're calling it at the moment. Uh, John, you have a number of materials and uh, slides and information that you've, you've compiled from your your own research. You are essentially an energy expert and you've uh, investigated this topic on your own and um, you've come up with a really a very thorough analysis of some of these topics. So I'm gonna share the screen and you can explain to us um, some of what we're looking at today and how it might be useful for all of us as we navigate some of these topics, as we hear about them in the press and the media constantly, um, how we can articulate and understand some of these concepts. So the first thing you have is this anthropogenic global warming. So anthropogenic, do you want to define to us the word anthropogenic and how, how it relates to this topic? Yeah, anthropogenic is just a, a sort of a precise scientific term that says that the cause of that particular warming is coming from human influences. And so the... Uh, the original idea of anthropogenic war global warming was that there is there is there is something going on with the climate. There's always been climate change, but in recent years it was hypothesized that some portion of it now can be directly explained by by human influences, which includes the increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, so, when, so when we're talking about this topic, that's the that's the diverging part is that there is historically throughout all of history there are always changes in climate. But we're talking about this very small part that involves human activity. And that is really what they're talking about when they're talking about climate change in our time. Is that correct? Um, yes. They, 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 if you look at the title slide here, they've got, I've got the, the term AKA global warming. So global warming is also something that could happen any, any time. There was a little ice age back in the 1600s, 1700s. And there was a warming period that came after that. Uh, that obviously wasn't caused by mankind induced carbon dioxide emissions. But they use the term global warming simply because it, it, they could capture that term. They would make you automatically assume that everything had a human influence to it. Same thing happened with the term climate change. If they could capture that term and change the definition to just being anytime the climate changes to be climate change, but the inference is that it's human caused then they would have you believing that anytime you hear the word climate change or global warming, yes. you automatically assume it's human thought. So, so this presentation really is about AGW, but I will use the term climate change and global warming simply because it rolls off my tongue easier. Okay, but and, it, is, uh, it is essentially conflating. We're conflating topics here. And in the narrative, as it's portrayed, it is, it is kind of conflated, isn't it? Well, absolutely, because uh, the presumption that we hear all the time is that anything that happens weather-wise, you know, any kind of bits that happen is caused by us. The latest yes. drought caused by us. The flood in Europe caused by us. The hurricane caused by us. Yeah, and it's, so it, it, you have to look at the historical record to make any sense that that makes any sense. So, but on many levels, like scientifically, logically, biblically, historically that would tell you that that's not correct. Everything that happens in the world is not because of us. Yeah, the planet's been around more than four and a half billion years. And, you know, we'll, we'll, sort, of, we'll sort of cover a little bit on some of the slides as we go through here, Stanley. Yeah. This first slide has to do with the idea that there is a narrative out there. Mm -hmm. And the narrative when it comes to climate change and I'll use that instead of AGW, but when it comes to climate change and wind and solar, really comes from the media who, who, who is constantly claiming that any, any event we have, you know, the latest forest, latest forest fire came from, came from a- um, Yes, that's a very, I think that's a very significant point, John. You're right. They never just talk about a naturally occurring forest fire or flood. It's always some human disaster. That's very interesting. Yeah, and, and it, it's always got these 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 words of doom and gloom in the future, and it's going to get worse from here, you know. And that's all. And we have to blame somebody. Threat. Somebody's to and blame. Blame somebody. somebody. Yeah, all those fossil fuel we'll companies are responsible because their emissions caused this to you. And well, academia is not I mean, much different. I, I think they uh, they tend to they tend to sort of brainwash our kids a little bit. Uh, well, I remember, and, you know, George Bush. George Bush. He was responsible. He was held responsible for 
uh, Katrina, the, the, the hurricane. <laughs> yeah, that, that wasn't very nice of him to do that, you know, I, I think that, uh, <laughs> you know, Katrina, I, I remember those storms well here in Houston. And then Harvey, most, Harvey most recently. Academia, so uh, higher education. Yeah, they, they certainly take a strong position and, and that strong position is consistent with what this narrative is all about. And then you have these other these other groups that, that are involved. The, I, the United Nations has something called the IPCC, which is the International Panel on Climate Change. And their, their role is primarily to confirm the human influence on climate. And uh, there's an interest, some interesting stories here. If you look at the next slide, just real quick, though, John, we, we skipped over the environmentalists, but if I remember correctly, there are people in forestry who do advocate for forest controls, and they are, but they're essentially maligned. But there are some voices out there who speak for management and conservation to cull and to clean out brush to prevent forest fires. So those there are some voices, some counter narratives. Oh, oh, absolutely, and and I'm not and I and I'm not trying to say that all everyone in the mainstream media and everybody in academia and every, all the environmentalists. Are in lockstep. I'm just saying that most yes. of that comes from the majority of most of these groups. But that would be something yeah. to listen to to the counter the counter voices. There are some out there. If you have a keen ear, you can you can tune into those people and you can hear a counter narrative. Yeah, part of part of this presentation is to help give some of those other counter narratives a little visibility. Yes, uh, you, helpful. You Very helpful. Yeah, you suggest well, you suggest you suggested that I was a, a someone who's knows a lot. I really don't. I'm kind of just a student of those that really do have that counter narrative. And so most of what I show you today will have uh, some sort of source identified of where I got the material from. So you can do your own research. Well, and John, that's yourself. also part of your thing is that that's part of science. A counter narrative is always part of science. Yeah, scientists is all, science is all, all about skepticism. And any beautiful hypothesis that a million people believe is true can be just can be taken out by a single person that 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 proves why it's not true, and so science is also a process of of of, of testing whether things are valid, and uh, part of the issue with uh, this current climate change narrative is is that uh, you know the science is always the science is always there. And if you look at the alarmist narrative, I've got some more detail for it. Yes, and essentially. Um, the, the theory is that, that that fossil fuels and other man man influenced sources of emissions contribute more of this to the atmosphere and then then increases the concentration in the atmosphere. CO2 is a greenhouse gas, and that that CO2 will lead to dangerous temperatures for the planet. And there actually is a policy of the United Nations which defines the dangerous temperature as 1.5 Celsius degree above. I guess pre-industrial, but it's it's kind of a random, randomly chosen uh, number, I believe. Uh, the fossil fuels. So the conclusion is the fossil fuels must be banned. Wind turbines, solar panels, and biofuels must provide our energy. And the science is settled, and almost all scientists agree. Uh, this last little line I got in blue there about the science being settled. That's just not the way science works. Science is always testing new hypotheses. And. Uh, whether you, whether you look at Galileo or, or anybody else as, as a perfect example of why that's true, you know, the, the people, people in science, you know, their business is, is testing ideas and, and testing new hypotheses, not saying it's over, you can't talk about this, you can't challenge this. We all agree. That's policy, it's not science. Uh, the next slide here um, is the part of the original narrative that I agree with. And basically, CO2 is a greenhouse gas. That's about the only thing from that original slide I agree with. And one other thing about the CO2 emissions is that the ones that are basically anthropogenic are only about 3% of the total CO2 emissions on the planet. Volcanoes are part of the natural emissions. Oceans also release carbon dioxide when they, they warm up. And then animals, when they breathe out, they release carbon dioxide emissions. So, 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 so but it's only 3% of the total. The other 97% are natural causes above what the AGW ones are. So 3% the, is the human activity. 3% is the amount of emissions that are cons considered to come from human activity. So it's just a fraction of the overall. The, the next slide here has to do with um, um, why I put NASA on that list a while ago of people that support the narrative. 
Uh, NASA is an agency that that is taken upon itself to, to help help everybody uh, could be convinced that the narrative is in fact true. And you can see a perfect example of, of the kind of stuff they do. The one on the left is a is a chart that NASA published online back in 1998, and you can see that little dot goes all the way to the top. And then they reprocessed all that data. And in 2016, they came back and they pushed all the older numbers down for the first part of the 20th century. And they, they raised the numbers to your right there. And so, so they are in fact proponents of climate change. They're not necessarily giving us an objective scientific viewpoint of what's happening. This, people at NASA certainly know much more about climate and weather than I do. But I would contend mm -hmm. that this is, this is the kind of thing that shows there's a distinct bias there. Um, if you look at the next chart, the next chart shows a viewpoint of what the temperature data looks like over the last 100, and in this case, 130 years. And it's very flat looking, John. It's very flat looking. So it's only when you go back to the NASA one where they say, okay, we're, we're 0 0.1 higher or 0.1 lower. They, they show the, the, the differences here and they amplify those, they make it look huge, but realistically, in the this context of shows, everything else, it's the same. In the context of everything, this is an average temperature. Yeah. So average temperature may go up slightly, it may come down slightly over time, but it looks to the naked eye until you get really, really in the, in the, in the, in the details. It looks pretty unexciting. So it's like taking people. a microscopic uh, view of my pet's fur in one slide and then uh, uh, from the surface looking at it differently. So it's just two. It's the same thing. It's just a different view, different scales, yeah, and so the, this is this is more about what we see on a daily basis. And in a place like Chicago, your temperature may get as high as ninety degrees in the summertime and as low as minus thirty in the wintertime. I don't know exactly what your temperature is, but this idea that one degree change in your daily temperature makes a difference is kind of is kind of hard to fathom. So that the next slide shows uh, six hundred million years of the Earth's history. This is a reconstruction of what's happened with carbon dioxide and temperature over time. The black line that goes from the upper left of that graph down to the lower right of that graph, graph is how carbon dioxide concentration of the atmosphere has changed over time. The blue line shows how temperatures have changed over line. And the blue graph, the blue line has a, uh, an axis to the right side that shows that when it's up at that flat portion, it's around 25 degrees Celsius. And when it's really in an ice age, it's down there around 10 degrees Celsius. Right now, in the current interglacial, we're closer to about 16 degrees Celsius. So in fact, the, the actual current is above this a little bit. But this is what a real temperature change looks like, not what's on the last graph. And so historically, you, we can see the temperature varying by 15 degrees Celsius over time. And the planet didn't run away. It, it, it basically had some stability to it. And and it, and it wasn't at the sort of the 25 degree set point. It went into an ice age. And at some point it came back out of it. We are currently in an ice age. And that's what the far right of that shows us. Yeah, it shows very point. low. Both of these levels are low. Yeah, and if you, looked, if you looked exactly at the carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide today is about 0.041% of the atmosphere. Yeah. So roughly four, molecules per 10,000 of the atmosphere. It's a trace gas. And, and to believe that that's the planet's control knob is a little bit difficult to fathom how someone could conclude that. Um, if you look you at also, the next slide, I'm sorry. And you also mentioned there's a lag between the carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide level, rising carbon dioxide comes later than right after, like 800 years after the rising temperature trend. Is that right? That's exactly right. And I could have brought a graph that showed that, but uh, you know, in the Inconvenient Truth book that Al Gore, uh, that Al Gore uh, movie, I guess Inconvenient Truth was a, was a video he created that was yes. took a lot of our kids at school. And in that, in that movie, he showed that you know, carbon dioxide and, and temperature seem to move exactly together. And it's like, there you have it. Carbon dioxide moves, temperature must move with it. You know? But the reality is what we're looking at in this graph here. Um, is that is that uh, I'm sorry. The, the reality was the graph above it, where you don't see carbon, you don't see carbon dioxide temperature that closely related. Yes. And if you look at the most recent recent century, you don't see it that closely related either. The, this graph you came back to, this actually shows 
the temperature during our current ice age. So typically there's been about 100,000 years of glaciation. And, and so the, we are in that little blue spike to the far right. And you see that during the last interglacial period, the last four periods would have been this, this period between glaciations, temperature has been higher than they are right now. So to say that the temperature and the planet is, is, is unusual, you're not looking at sort of the best reconstructions of what the temperature is doing. Yes. You're also ignoring the fact that oh, in the last 100,000 years, most of our temperatures have been as part of that glaciation. And to put that perspective, that would be like having maybe two miles of ice sitting above Manhattan or a mile of ice sitting above Oklahoma. And so it's a, the world with glaciation is a lot worse than the world that we're in now, which is where we've got a, a, you know, a much, much more anthropogenic supporting temperatures <laughs> where we can grow a lot of crops, we can feed a lot of people, we can support a planet with 7.5 7 billion people. The next slide, for example, um, shows what the temperatures have looked like over the last 4,000 years. And this basically is what climate change really looks like. This is only from a, from, a, from a particular point in Greenland. So this is not global temperatures, but the global temperatures aren't much different than this for the last 4,000 years. And what you see here is that temperatures have in fact been higher several times over the last 4,000 years. And you see the climate's constantly changing. So the portion that everybody's trying to blame on anthropogenic influences is the little, the little ellipse over there in red that I've circled with that little spike up in temperature. That's what we're being told is now must be caused by mankind. And it just gives you a sense of how much climate change there really is and, and why any change in temperature is not necessarily that abnormal. And, it, and it's hard for me having seen all these historical temperature changes to believe that suddenly the attribution for the most recent temperature is now mankind's fault. It's a, difficult, it's a difficult theory for me to, to believe, just given the historical reconstruction we're seeing here. John, um, you mentioned the word population briefly, and I don't think we have a chart showing po how population cor corresponds to these different trends, but aren't we at a world uh, record, like at, we're at highest population levels, aren't we on the planet currently? Yes, we are. The population was about 1.7 billion people on Earth in 1900. And as of 20, as of 2021, I think the population is about 7.5 billion people. But so would so you we say that, that that's the because the Earth can support it? You mentioned that crops are doing better, we're more green areas on the planet, and through the use of energy and technology and resulting from the uh, Industrial Revolution, there have been so many advances for so many people at the lower end of the spectrum and the higher end that we have more people. So isn't that, isn't that a, a good cause and effect in a positive direction? Well, well I, I think so. I mean, I mean um, the, the warming that we've been experiencing, this, this, this 0.8 degrees Celsius over the last 150 years has mostly been put to the planet. And I mean, if the earth and, is in- And basically- um, If the earth is in the life supporting business, and human life is part of that. So isn't the warming that for the success? planet the last 150 years has, has, has basically um, been, been good for the planet. And, and all these dire predictions from the 60s, from the Club of Rome and other organizations that said mankind would, would be just you know, subject to the Malthusian theory and, and overrun with wars and famines by 2000. None of those are remotely true. We've, we've come up with genetically engineered seeds. We've come up with with, with more efficient ways to grow crops. And actually, the 7.5 7 billion people, there are fewer people in poverty now than was the case in 1900. So, so yes, the, the planet has supported the growth in our population and fossil fuels have helped allow us to achieve that in the kind of material wealth that we've gotten accustomed to. So throwing those out the window is, is not something that uh, should be done lightly until we understand what the implications of that would be. So there are more people on the planet and there are less people living in poverty. That's true. There's still there's still a number of people who are in serious poverty, particularly in in sort of the uh, the southern part of Africa, the sub-Saharan portion of Africa, where I think we see a lot of population growth scheduled to happen. But it's awful good. It's awful good to uh, uh, allow them a way to get out of poverty. 
Now this next slide, we're always hearing about clean energy. And you know, this is what's actually happened with US air quality. Um, and you see that we've been, we've been managed, even with our fossil fuel country, we've managed to bring air quality down to much improved standards over the, over the last, uh, you know, last group of years. And uh, what's it's not actually this actually air quality up, you mean, they, they, it's improved. Oh, yeah. the, the, this is the <laughs> amount of pollutants. This is the amount of pollutants in, in yes. the air. <laughs> and that little dotted line is kind of where the standard was. And everything now is below that line. And so our air quality is much, much better. So to say that we're, we're now, it's urgent that we improve the quality of our air. It's not clear why you're saying urgent. There's a good question of how much, how much is it worth spending to improve the air quality further? That's a valid question. But the air quality has gotten continually better in this country. And one of the things that's not on here is carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide is not a pollutant as much as the EPA or somebody might want you to believe. You know, it's, it's naturally plants. occurring. It's naturally occurring, it's good for plants. And, and in fact, the more carbon dioxide that the plants have, uh, the better it is for those plants. If you look at the next slide, you can see sort of an experiment was done over the same amount of time where they, they buried the amount of, of carbon in a particular greenhouse. And you see the plants that got the most, the most uh, um, carbon dioxide concentration in the greenhouse had 450% as much growth as the one that was down there a little below where we are right now. Yeah, I find that and fascinating because we never hear anything good about carbon. We never hear of any benefit from carbon about carbon dioxide ever. Yeah, well, greenhouses keep their greenhouses a lot of times they keep it at a thousand parts per million in carbon dioxide because the plants just grow better as this thing shows. And the way they get there is they actually use fossil fuels like propane or something to burn in the greenhouse, to raise the carbon dioxide levels. So uh, to believe this wouldn't work, you know, isn't good for the planet. You've got to, you've got to ask yourself, you know, how good has it been for all the, the crop improvements we've seen in the last uh, 50 years? Well, every plant I get from the greenhouse always looks amazing. And I guess now I know why. Yeah, you got to breathe on because you breathe out 4% carbon dioxide. So uh, is that why we should talk to our plants, John? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and, and, uh, keep, keep them close to you. Okay. The, uh, the, the slide here is, is basically why it is that the narrative is shared with us because people, are generally, once they believe in something, they kind of want to continue to believe it's true. And most people don't have much background about any of the science related to global warming. And, and so I'm going to show you some slides here that, that, that outline why I believe the narrative has continued to been growing. This is produced by the Yale Climate Opinion Group, Yale University. And they show various maps of, of different opinion surveys they've done pretty much since I think 2008. This is one from 2020, and it shows that this number of people believe that global warming is happening, 72%. And that's not a particular surprise, it's 2020. But if you look at the next slide, we see that in 2016, you know, the, the, the number was only 70%. So in the last two years, they think they've gained 2%, which, which is neither here nor there because global warming kind of has been happening. I, I, look, at the, I look at the satellite, and the weather balloon data, and they both support the idea that there's been a little global warming since like since mm. like 1979 when that when the sat when the satellites okay. were launched into space. So, but does that mean that this is anthropogenically caused? Absolutely not. Yes. It just means there's a little well, warming. That's, that's, so, John, that's, that's the whole thesis of this talk. Basically, is that we don't need to deny climate change or global warming because those are naturally occurring uh, things at all times and all places. We just have to. Uh, disagree about what's causing it. That's exactly. what, that's the whole because, thesis. Because, exactly, because the solution is what sometimes causes the damage if the solution is yes. not, not a good one for us. Uh, the next, next slide shows a little different perspective. Um, this one shows how many people believe that global warming will harm them personally. As of 2020, that number was, 20, uh, that number was 43%. All the areas in purple are areas where they believe less than 43%. The areas in green are areas where they, they believe it's higher than 43%. And it's interesting to me when I look at this map, but I see areas like California where there have been a lot of forest fires that, would, that are constantly telling them this is being caused by extreme weather and climate change. You look at Texas, where we've had some hurricanes. People here may be believing that, that the climate change is real because they've been told that constantly. You look at Southern Florida, where they've had some hurricanes as well. And so, so 
where, where people believe that, that climate change or global warming affect them personally um, is, is an interesting indicator. And what's a better one is you look at the next map, this was taken in 2016, and you look at the same areas, and the same areas like California don't light up like that. Texas doesn't light up like that. So there's been a lot of narratives in the last four years, mostly from the media, telling us that okay. everything from Hurricane Harvey to the to the droughts in the Northwest to to the forest fires in California are caused by climate change. When in fact, the forest fires themselves were probably often caused by bad forest management and not not getting rid of the not clearing out the dead debris in the forest. And over time, that accumulates and, and sets you up for much larger fires, like we've seen in the last couple of years. Um, but, but more important, though, John, this is kind of the turning point of the presentation because, again, it's the, it's coming to the forefront again about the conflation of these terms. That none of us need to deny climate change or even global warming. We just we're really debating the cause of it and being led down, led down a rabbit hole of bad policy uh, by by a perversion of the narrative is really the problem. Sam, that's, that's exactly right. I think it's very insightful of you to say that. All right, now this is this is for one of my 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 favorite climate deniers, which is kind of the term that gets thrown at people that have an alternate opinion to the narrative or the hypothesis posited by the IPCC. And let me just read this to you because I think I think it's a pretty powerful piece. And he says, "But does it matter if global warming is a crisis or not?" Aren't we threatened by a serious temperature rise? Shouldn't we act anyway because we are stewards of the environment? Herein lies the moral danger behind global warming hysteria. Each day, 20,000 people in the world die of waterborne diseases. Half a billion people go hungry. A child is orphaned by AIDS every seven seconds. This does not have to happen. We allow it while fretting about saving the planet. What is wrong with us that we downplay this human misery before our eyes and focus on events that will probably not happen even in a hundred years hence? We know that the greatest cause of environmental degradation is poverty. On this, we can and must act. Um, climate change is a norm, not an exception. It is both an opportunity and a challenge. The real crisis for 4 billion people in the world remain poverty, dirty water, and the lack of a modern energy supply. By contrast, global warming represents an echochondria of the pampered rich. Uh, this is from the late Philip Scott, who is the, the, uh, a former emeritus professor of the, the University of London. But I think it's a very powerful piece that talks about you know, who's getting left out of this whole narrative. And uh, the people in Africa I spoke about in deep poverty, when they get left out, you know, they, they have to have large family sizes in order to try to have some social welfare when they get older. They, 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 they have a lot of people dying of smoke in their lungs because they don't have an electric stove they just turn on and operate. They, they, have, they have trash, they dump it, they throw it anywhere they want to. They, they have the least respect for the environment because yes. they're the ones who've got the most to, most to lose if, 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 by, by, trying to, by trying to live without the reasonable energy access. Yeah, it's very scathing, very scathing, John. Yeah, he's a powerful speaker. Um, now, this next graph shows the, the actual uh, temperatures as observed by um, uh, both weather balloons and, and, uh, and satellites. There's, there's basically three satellites, and this is from two of the three satellites. And it also shows projections from the climate models that are mostly from the IPCC, which is this United Nations organization trying to convince us of global warming. So they make these dire predictions about how fast temperature is going to rise and what it's going to mean to us. But the reality is they've been really amped up and there's mostly been a temperature pause for the last 20 years. And so there's good reason why their numbers are so amped up. They tend to assume positive feedbacks that are just sort of built into the model. And those feedbacks are often consistent with, with cloud issues and water vapor issues that aren't very well understood. Uh, the next graph um, sort of shows um, where the IPC comes out on this. So, so they are to the left of that line. So there's some positive feedbacks. But the best guess of where the actual, actual feedback should be, it should be actual negative. That because of, because of, of water vapor and clouds, it should actually be over to the right where the, the, what the, what the satellite data suggested is in fact the case. But that difference, if these models were to actually use a negative feedback as opposed to the positive feedback, they'd be a lot closer 
the actual temperatures, and they wouldn't give, be giving us these dire predictions for where the global temperature is going to be going in the next 70, 80 years. Um, this is um, from the America, Kim, American Chemical Society, and, and they had a, just a little discussion on their website. And the discussion says, remark, the earth has certainly been warming since we've added so much CO2 to the atmosphere from fossil fuel burning. And the reply, forget the CO2, water vapor is the most important gas. It controls the earth's temperature. And these are guys that are understanding sort of how the, the, the chemicals, the chem chemistry of the, of the atmosphere works. And uh, this shows sort of the breakdown between uh, water vapor, which, which sort of varies between 2% mm -hmm. and 4% of the, of, the, of the sky on any given day. On some days, the humidity is higher and the number is higher. Other days, the humidity is lower and, and the water vapor level is lower. But the majority but, of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere at any given time is water vapor, is what water you're vapor, saying. But here. it changes. It, 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 it basically you know, can be in, in many different forms here. And you see that CO2 is just it's a small fraction of what, what water vapor does. So if you don't assume a positive feedback, you can't get to these really aggressive numbers that these climate models get to. Um, and and uh, uh, I think the next the quote is an interesting one. I, I think uh, this is from Joe Nova, who's another one of our, our, our climate skeptics. And she has some interesting observations here. She says that, uh, that over the last decade, 28 million weather balloons, 30 years of satellite recordings, and 3,000 robotic ocean buoys confirmed that if the carbon dioxide disaster wasn't dead, it was on the critical list. <laughs> Not critically important, but critically wounded. And she goes, few realize that a trillion dollar industry was based entirely on a guess made in 1896 about relative humidity, and that the guess appears to be wrong. So this is just going back to somebody, somebody guessed about the way humidity worked and the way, the way it was associated with carbon dioxide. And frankly, it appears that guess is not a good one, but a lot of climate models still assume it is. And that's her point. After 20 years of, 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 of no temperature rise, it's kind of a broken hypothesis. Now you'll see databases that show a temperature rise. And a lot of times was, that, that data has been massaged and adjusted and and it's also somewhat manipulated by a bunch of surface weather stations. But I would, I would rely upon the satellite data and the weather balloon data that I showed you a second ago. It's much more reliable data in general, much less, much more, much more impartial, I think. Very interesting. Um, now, this is, this is sort of the second part of the presentation. This is, these are my own feelings about wind and solar power. And, and we've seen, in Texas, anyway, we've seen we've seen subsidies for these types of renewable energy sources get subsidized for the past 30 years. There are renewable portfolio standards in most states that describe how much wind and solar we should be adding to the system. There's 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 a renewable energy credits. There's there's other power purchase agreements with with feed-in tariffs. There's all kind of things designed to give wind and solar an economic advantage because they just aren't as affordable as fossil fuels are. And what's worse about it is they don't, they don't reduce carbon dioxide emissions, mostly because wind and solar is so erratic and so unreliable. They've got to be offset by a fossil fuel generating system that, that yes. does the opposite of what they do so that we can get a level energy. And so... Um, the net result is that that when they run that fossil fuel plant like that, it's very, very inefficient. It's like driving and stop and go traffic. Uh, it's very inefficient compared to like getting on the freeway and putting your, putting your pedal down and just going at a steady pace. You get a much better gas miles in the freeway than you do in that stop and go traffic going just a very few miles. And so they don't actually lower carbon dioxide emissions. They drive up electricity costs, which I'll show you on the next slide. And they also are not necessarily that green. Now this slide shows what's happened with wind and solar prices in Europe, because Europe's a bit ahead of us here. And they've been pushing this narrative longer than we have. They've been buying it longer than we have. And the net result is that Germany and Denmark have some of the highest electricity prices in the world. If I showed you Australia's energy prices, they would be slightly above this. And we're talking about 30 cents a kilowatt hour. 
the U.S. is shown down here somewhere around maybe eight cents a kilowatt hour. Wow. So they're almost difference. they're almost four times our electricity level. Now California probably is closer to twenty cents a kilowatt hour. So California has done some strange things with their own energy system. And, and it's driven their cost higher, but that's, a, that's what Californians do sometimes. <laughs> and, so, and so part of the problem is when you push this narrative of wind and solar and you, and you subsidize them, it can drive you to these adverse solutions like this, where you've got a lot higher energy prices and it's unreliability. And, and like we're seeing in California, blackouts, like we see in Texas recently, freeze Mageddon back last February when I went 40 hours without any kind of electricity in my house when the temperature was 35 degrees in my house, you know, it wow. was an appreciation that the wind and solar units weren't helping much when the, when the cold front came through and demand should have increased. You need to jack that up. And, and they just, most of them froze. It sort of fell down a bit. So uh, I think, I think the, the idea that we need to continue to subsidize wind and solar is not a, it's not a good one. I think we should let them stand on their own feet. So if they believe they're cheaper, you know, show us, show us you're cheaper and show us you can provide reliable energy that we can all use at that price you, if they, want to, they want to compete at. And I think we do that. We'll keep our energy prices at affordable levels, which help, help it does help the, the cheap, the, the poorest among us because the poorest of us among us are the ones that have the hardest time buying electricity and a hard time meeting their cooling and their heating requirements in, in the summer and the winter, respectively. Very interesting. Um, now this is coming from an environmentalist, and there's a there's a couple of these out there that have, that have basically been a part of this, this narrative in the past, and and what Michael Schellenberger said. This was in a TED talk that he gave, and the reference is shown on the slide. This is toward, toward the end of the talk. He says, "I think it's also understandable that as the facts have come in, that many of us have started to question our prior beliefs and change our minds." For me, the question now is. Now that we know that renewables can't save the planet, are we going to keep letting them destroy it? And Michael, Michael Schellenberger just produced a re book recently, and, and he talked about this in some detail. He believes, he believes in, in that, that carbon dioxide emissions do cause warming, so he's not, a, he's not a completely un, in line with what I'm saying today. But he believes that maybe nuclear energy would be a much better source because that would give you reliable, dependable energy that could in fact replace fossil fuels uh, completely as opposed to requiring them to run these very in inefficient support operations. Yes. Now, this next slide is, is a, a picture of what net zero looks like. We hear that next zero is supposed to happen you know, by 2050 for the United States. And, and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, England's got something called absolute zero emissions. And, and they're pushing these political narratives trying to, to greatly reduce fossil fuel usage, trying to greatly increase wind and solar, and trying to drive carbon emissions to zero. Now, you've got to understand that Europe has been working this for more than about 10 years more than we have, and they've been much more committed than we have. But let's look at the next slide and see how successful they've been. The next slide shows what carbon dioxide emissions have actually done on Earth. And, and this shows that they've continued to increase over time. And this sort of has a breakdown by country. And I'm going to show you a better breakdown of this in a couple of slides. But all of these, all of this talk about, about driving us to lower emissions and all the, all the wind and solar have been installed in Europe and all the subsidies they're paying annually to all their wind and solar producers haven't lowered the world's global emissions very much. If you look at the next slide, here's another, another representation of the same thing. This is this is those same data points juxtapositioned with the, the atmospheric CO2 readings at the Moana Loa Observatory in the Pacific. And you see here that, that carbon dioxide emissions have just continued to increase regardless of what we've done trying to stop them. So the idea that net zero is even possible remains to be seen and certainly not the way that's been done in Europe, which is what the United States seems to be hell bent on trying to, trying to imitate with this latest administration. Now, the next slide shows part of what's going on. You see, there's a really steep red line there. Yeah, that's fascinating. Who is that, yeah. John? Who's that that's, red line? That's China. If you look at that steep yellow line, that's India. And both of these countries have been bringing their populations out of poverty. China has done a great deal to improve that country since 1990. And, and the change there is remarkable. 
I've made seven trips to China in the last 10 years and I've seen it firsthand. And I love their fast trains. I love the fact that they've got uh, so many new buildings, so much modern infrastructure. They're really doing a great job of taking care of their people. And, and frankly, they don't want to stop doing that job anytime soon. So under the Paris Accord, they've got no obligations to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions at all. And neither does India. You hear lately about some sort of very minor carbon thing China might do, but I think it's more for marketing because China likes to sell people wind turbines and solar panels and electric cars and you name it. And, and if they, they show a little bit of empathy toward Europe, maybe they'll, they'll have some great sales to Europe of the same products going forward. But you see the US has actually fallen by about 15% in their carbon dioxide emissions. And what that came from was replacing coal power plants with, carb, with, with uh, natural gas power plants. And you see Europe, you know, that's what Europe's done with all their investments in, in wind and solar. And, and, and the UK has got like 9,000 wind turbines now. And you look at Europe and you say, no, just hasn't moved the needle that much. At least it's flat in Europe. But, but, uh, but part of that represents that a lot of their manufacturers have been moved offshore. If you were actually to count the emissions associated with, with some of the manufacturing work done in China, for example, and then re-exported back to the UK, re-imported into the UK, their carbon dioxide emissions, given their consumption levels, have actually gone up from where they used to be. So... They haven't but, accomplished much with their strategy. But John, I'm going to ask you a gotcha, a gotcha question here, though. So, you know, earlier you're saying that the all of our efforts and uh, policies and uh, new developments have not done anything to reduce the rising carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But here in this chart, it does show that some individual countries have gone down. But you're saying that overall, it's not gone down because it's been offset by these countries that are still leading the way with rising, rising levels. Is that right? Well, I mean, the, the, the former Soviet Union, I think, let's see if I look at that one. I think it's the green one here. So it's sort of, sort of Eastern Europe, former Soviet Union. They were, they were just so terribly inefficient. They had all these you know, power plants and coal power plants that were just uh, wasting energy left and right. And so since, since, since the, the Iron Curtain fell, you say they're doing, they're doing better, uh, but they've also, they've also lost a lot of people in Russia, for example, <laughs> and there may be some other reasons why that's happened in Russia. Europe has, has done all this, but, but they haven't really, they haven't driven it to net zero by any standards, and, in, and, and all the other countries, if you look, they're all actually increasing, to include the Australia area, you know, it shows, Australia, it shows down there at the bottom, you see Africa's even increased in carbon dioxide emissions. So no, there's only a couple of the places in the world that are even attempting it, and they're not having very compelling results. The good news is that carbon dioxide is not a pollutant. And so it doesn't really matter in the big scheme of things other than making plants healthier. Um, now the next, the next slide is coming from these materials that are called absolute zero emissions. And they are being put out by academic organizations that are on contract with the UK government. And so while these are not officially promulgated by the UK government, you can see the way that they're thinking about the world. Now, this, this, this graph actually has an additional 20 years to the right side of it where they show what they think they're going to do to replace this, but they want to get rid of all airports. For example, line number third one down, all airports except Heathrow, Glasgow, and Belfast closed with transfers by well. well by, by 20, between 2030 and 2049, all remaining airports closed. Shipping, 2030, 2049, all shipping declines to zero. And then you look at you look at the next slide, and this shows this shows some more from that same table. And so they show all fossil fuels completely phased out. All electricity, fourfold increase in renewable generation from 2020. You know, and you got you've got uh, materials, they've got cement and new steel. You know, phased out, and 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 so they're making these huge and extraordinarily aggressive actions, trying to to meet this political narrative in their own country, and that's, that is going to give them dire consequences. This is not going to end well, especially when India and China are just moseying along, building new power plants, improving the welfare of their citizens, and increased 
increasing the standard of living of, what, of, of, of the way that people live in those countries. Well, John, so, that's the second time you've used, you referred to improving the welfare of the citizens. I mean, how does the climate change philosophy as policy, how does that benefit? I mean, saving the planet as the narrative goes, but how does it benefit us as individuals? Um, well, if, if in fact could save the planet, you know, we're, we're members of the planet and that would help us. But, but the reality is since the narrative itself doesn't work, the climate models don't show us, don't show us anything that's it's meaningful. The actual temperature hasn't increased and carbon dioxide is not really correlated with something that's gonna drive much of a temperature increase because you saw historically, you know, that carbon dioxide level, levels were really, really high and temperature was at the same level. Carbon dioxide levels fell really low, temperature's at the same level. It didn't make a difference whatsoever with what happened to temperature. So the way this plays out right now with the current narrative is that they don't let the countries in Africa have access to fossil fuels. They don't want them to build coal power plants. They want to fund them to put in like a solar or a wind power plant, which is horribly expensive and terribly unreliable. So you don't oh. give them much relief. You know, they can't even they can't even run a refrigerator to store medicines most of the time with that kind of energy access. And so you take the people most in need of, of, of needing to follow some sort of development track and get out of poverty. And it just tells them, you guys don't get to participate. And so it's, it's, it's terrible, particularly in the developing world, how this plays out with, with human life. And, and uh, I don't understand how they get away with it, why they believe that this is something that, that uh, makes any sense to the, to, our, to the civilization we have. We should be supporting those guys, get them out of poverty. And, and when global population stabilizes a little above 10, million, 10 billion people you know, by 2070, um, they'll be part of that. They'll, they'll, they'll have gotten education. They'll have found a way to raise their kids in a productive way. And, and uh, they'll be much happier citizens of our planet and, and much less likely to do damage to the environment. So I, I think that's the way it's playing out. The current narrative is, is just not good for a good portion of the planet. Yeah, I just don't understand how that makes sense. So how can these impoverished countries invest in solar and alternative energy sources how are they supposed to invest it? How are they going to get money to invest well, and buy these the materials? Money, the money I'm talking about is coming from the United Nations. And it's coming from, from, from financial organizations who, who are under their auspices. They will provide funding for, for wind and solar, but they're not providing the funding for the, for the coal power plant. And the, the International Energy Agency is trying to, to also stop further development of fossil fuels. So, so they're not doing anything to encourage these countries to follow a development track, which has worked for other countries. You know, if China could not have used fossil fuels to develop, they would have not had the profound growth they've had since 1990. And so for us to believe that other countries can follow a, a, a greener or more friendly, friendly track, which is horribly expensive and unreliable, just is unfair to those countries. It's gonna keep them where they are longer. They'll have, they'll have more, more population, more, more, more birth from people trying to protect their old age, and it's it's gonna it's gonna just be a, a continued issue for for them getting out of that desperate poverty. John, I think that's a topic for yet another video of the uh, energy crisis and the third world, and it's a very interesting. I have to I have to reflect on that more, and we'll have to talk about it a little bit more next time. But let's continue on yeah. on our journey today. Well, this is just this is just some other conservative speaking points. So, so this presentation uh, was to to assist in how conservatives can think about uh, which of these issues, you know, we can actually give some pushback onto the narrative because the narrative is out there and it's strong. If you're trying to convince someone that that the narrative has issues, better be very careful with what their their hard form opinions are. So. The CSG movement that's happening, trying to knock investment away from anything that resembles fossil fuel, is literally a, a fossil fuel attack. But we're seeing a lot more of these, and we're seeing them being represented by all sorts of, of organizations trying to, to make these standard financial reports. Um, the next one, nuclear energy, need, kind of needs to be decriminalized. And Alex Epstein has a great presentation on this. He talks about why it is that, that we've made it almost impossible to build a nuclear energy power plant in the United States. Why is it that both New York and California are shutting down existing nuclear power plants 
if you really believe that carbon dioxide is an issue, they should be keeping those power plants open. They should be building no more nuclear power plants. That's not part of this dialogue. And then the last point is about carbon taxes. Basically, I think that a lot of people who are in good faith offering what could sound like a, a economic way to do this, a, a way that's consistent with, 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 with reasonable economic policy, generally don't have an understanding of, of what's really underneath the climate change narrative. So I would challenge those people to go back, do some homework, and then maybe bring this back out if they still believe that, that, that it's something that they should be pushing. But right now, I'd say there's so much uncertainty here that we shouldn't get hung up with this. Now, this brings me to the, to the next slide here. This is sort of a set of those, those same speaking points. This is our favorite um, one, John. We love this. Um, Oops, yeah, sorry. Well, it, it, it's, I apologize, but it's hard to see. I've tried to cover these through this presentation. This kind of explains the order I had this in. But this, this shows the speaking points in the, 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 the large middle column there. The, 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 the column to the right that shows the green boxes, these are areas where I believe the timing is right. And I believe we can sort of safely argue these points without getting too much technical pushback by, by those that are, that are you know, just basically the, the, the real proponents of this narrative. Now, the ones on the right, I think we've got our work cut, up, cut out for us. And I think it's I think the point is true, but I think you you run a risk of them just making a stand here and not being able to listen to anything you have to say. Say, you know, I've tried to talk to high schoolers sometimes, and I, I can I can say some things to them, and the lights will kind of go on, and then I'll say something else, and then that's not what my teacher told me, and then I'm I'm, I'm outside their outside their understanding of what, what how it works, and and they don't want to listen to me. They don't believe that I'm a, I, I could understand something about this they may not understand. And so there's a lot of detail there. I can't really cover it all, but I'm gonna cover the ones in red, which mostly are associated with, with the green points. The first one is that there has been a narrative. I think just recognizing that is an important thing to see um, how this plays out every time you pick the paper up and read about another extreme weather event that's now blamed on climate change. The climate models are over -amped. This is important to understand because since there's been no warming, the climate movement has to fall back on trying to convince us that the climate models are valid. And if you recognize they're not valid, then it takes away a real strong reason to, to follow along with their logic. Uh, another, another point is that carbon dioxide is good for plants. And, and nobody should really be arguing with this. It's, you know, carbon dioxide is not pollution. But a portion of the carbon dioxide we're putting in the atmosphere has improved the planet. It's, there's been a, something like 11% more growth around the planet from all the plants that have just been loving this additional carbon dioxide and grown better because of it. Uh, I love that. I think that's, that's a great, I think that's my favorite talking point. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. I mean, if carbon dioxide is good for us, why don't we actually have more? Exactly. Good arguments why it would be important. Wind and solar should no longer be subsidized. And, and in Texas, I saw it play out this way. We have, we have a competitive energy system. Here. And sometimes energy, electricity prices, spot prices can be negative, which means it could be like 0.5 cents a kilowatt hour. But with the subsidies, wind and solar can, can buy that electricity at negative prices, slap their, their subsidies on them and make a great profit. And so, so the point is, is that when they do that, and, 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 and coal, natural gas, nuclear, none of them can bid negative electricity prices. Those subsidies themselves are harmful to us making intelligent energy solutions, which keep our electricity prices affordable. And affordable is for all of us. You know, If you happen to be in a family that makes a lot of money, maybe electricity prices don't matter to you. But if you're in a family with budgets tight, you have to decide whether or not you, you, you feed your kids or keep them warm in the wintertime. And that's an awful difficult choice to make. Um, the next point about net zero being a dumb idea, it's just, it's just they've, they've given us no evidence that they can make any progress. We've got too many countries that aren't playing along with this. Um, and, and some really good uh, scientists have looked at this and said, you know, we need to be looking at adaption, not trying to fix carbon dioxide emissions now, allowing them just to continue on. But if we ever get to a point where there would be harm from the carbon dioxide emissions, we actually saw some warming. 
or we actually saw other issues at that point in time, then we respond to what are the issues and you do adapt adaptation. There's a good chance we never see any issues, but that's compared to maybe trying to spend $20 trillion to build all these wind and solar installations that'll have to be replaced in 20 years. You know, that's, that's a pretty scary down escalator. Um, now that I put the same net zero idea in yellow there, just to make sure nobody missed it. Net zero is a particularly bad idea if China and India do not participate alongside us. So if China and India are, 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 are basically the world's manufacturing base, so maybe a lot of what they're actually manufacturing is for the United States and Europe and other countries. Maybe if they're not going to try to reduce their carbon dioxide emissions, maybe we shouldn't either. Particularly why if we get real blown up on trying to unilaterally do this to ourselves while they don't do anything. I think it puts us in a bad strategic position as a country and leaves us exposed to, to all kind of economic issues that, that, uh, that certainly they won't be experiencing in India and China. Uh, nothing's wrong with nuclear energy and forget carbon taxes. So that kind of sums up all the conservative speaking points I was gonna talk about. Now, I've got some additional slides that are kind of cool, but I've been talking a long time here. So, <laughs> So if you want me to keep going, I, I'd love to do it. And then you can slice, slice it together the way you like. Uh, let's keep going along here, John. Okay, good. All right, this is Steve Coonan. He used to be the science, science advisor to former President Obama. And it's not easy to verify this information anymore online because most of the, the people that used to sort of, sort of tout his qualifications have modified their biograph biography of him to, rem to remove this particular qualification. But, but he wrote a book that got released in 2021. And what he says about it is that uh, adaptation is the way to go. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about the, the red stuff I show in this slide here, advocating that we only make low risk changes until we have a better understanding of why the climate is changing and how it might change in the future is a stance some might call waffling, but I prefer the terms realistic and prudent. I can respect the opinions of others who might come to different conclusions as I hope they would respect mine. Those differences can only be resolved if we realize they were ultimately about values, not about the science. Now, the name of this book uh, is basically Unsettled. So his, his, his opinion as someone that worked in the Obama administration as a scientist working on this is that the science is clearly unsettled. And he was very kind in that book because I read it. He was very kind in that book about not going with too much criticism against the people that are currently in the narrative, but, but uh, uh, he's also very clear that, that, that we don't know enough to be to making major investments at this point in time. But are you saying that he was somewhat marginalized because he had this, what seemed to be a more moderate or alternative view? Almost anyone who's espoused any kind of criticism has been marginalized. Well, that's very sad and, and ironic. Well, it's, 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 sure, it's sort of evidence of why, this, why what's going on in, in the climate change arena is not actually science. Now this next guy is another guy who's an environmentalist, and he sort of he sort of believes that some of this this climate change stuff, that some of the anthropogenic claim stuff is true, but he's also uh, very honest about how successful he thinks it's been. And so his, so his third, I'm going I'm to quote him here: "30 years of climate policy have failed to rein in temperature rises or reduce carbon intensity." The Paris wow. Agreement has put us collectively on a pathway towards incurring gigantic costs, especially for the poorest, with next to no climate benefit. Thus far, humanity has excelled at showing how not to fix the climate. And I, th I think these are some sobering reality points, because he was once upon a time part of this whole alarmist narrative. And he kind of said, you know, you know the path that, that was chosen didn't work, hasn't worked, and we need to get on a different path. So I think some of these guys who used to be part of part of the original IPCC narrative and have left that train are, are good people to pay attention to because they've been there, they've done that, and they've come to a different conclusion. The next slide talks about a woman named Judith Curry. And she was the, the department head of, I think, the Georgia Tech, um, I, I believe it was the climate program there. Um, that may not have been the exact name of that department, but she's made some, some very, very interesting observations. She too has, used to be on the side of the IPCC and came across from the dark side back to a side which is much more circumspect about what's going on. In her mind, she says, circus temperatures have increased since 1880. 
humans are adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere and carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases have a warming effect on the planet. So this, these are things that most people agree on. So she says it ha there has been some increase since 1880. The disagreement is this, whether the warming since 1950 has been dominated by human causes. How much the planet will warm in the 21st century? Whether warming is dangerous? Whether we can afford to radically reduce CO2 emissions? And whether reduction will improve the climate? So these are some pretty serious questions that punch gaping holes in the narrative that tell us at least to be cautious. Let's yeah. not go implementing policy that, that drives us to spending trillions of dollars on a strategy that's not very science-based or not very supportable with the current science and the current knowledge. Um, I've got just a couple more slides here. The next one talks about what's happened with vehicle emissions versus vehicle travel. So even with fossil fuels, there was continuous improvement. There were improvements in the gas mileage standards. There was an improvement in the catalytic converters. We see here that the volatile organic compounds, which this shows, have, have decreased dramatically by mile travel. So now to say we're gonna ban all internal combustion engines and only go with electric vehicles is kind of dumping a lot of progress that we've made scientifically and, and engineering, in engineering sense to reduce production, to reduce pollution, and to, and to to improve the operation of, of our vehicles. And so um, the, and John, uh, the next- uh, I'm sorry. John, just real quick though, it, making cars more efficient, fuel efficient was really more of a um, benefit to consumers because it costs less to fuel the vehicle. That was primarily the driver, at least early on, don't you think? Not necessarily. Um, I, was, I was in Europe as a kid, I was a military brat. And in, in 1969, when we lived there, gasoline prices were already, already $4 a gallon. You know, they were probably, I don't know, 50 cents in the US at the time, a lot lower prices in the US, right? And so the Europeans, when they faced those kind of gasoline prices, they, 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 they raised, uh, you know, they had a lot of very small cars. They, they felt those prices. And so, yeah, they, when, they, when, they were, when they were pushed up against that, they made those kind of choices. Um, after, if you look at in, 19, in 1972, there was an oil embargo and, and oil prices screamed highwards. And, and by, by, the late, by the late 70s, we found ourselves trying to come up with alternate energy and, and, and people were buying all kind of you know, cooler cars. But by 1985, you know, oil prices crashed again, natural gas prices crashed again, and we had some pretty low prices. People drive a lot of big trucks. They buy big houses. They've got big cars. We could we could get by with less energy, but right now at these prices, there's no compelling reason to do so. So that's a different that's a different discussion. I mean, there's nothing wrong with conservation. There's nothing wrong with us turning the lights off when we leave a room. I think all of that is good for us. All of that is good, and and not wasting energy. And so um, to say that people naturally buy cars that that just drive get better gas mileage. Uh, depends on how much more those costs cost, how much more those cars cost, how much, how much they are committed to, to saving energy and how important it is economic. And so these are things we're constantly paying attention to. And, and over time, I, I think that the, um, the vehicles can, get, can, can improve, improve the, way they, the way they treat air quality, which we've seen, and they can improve the efficiency they, they, they're driven with. And uh, I think I, I don't think there's anything wrong with people, you know, having it, wanting to make sure they buy an efficient vehicle. Buy an electric no. vehicle doesn't necessarily get you there. But. No, I don't think there is either. But I just was saying that that's, I would perceive that that's been a driver longer than the climate change. Like, are more people are going to buy a car traditionally that's efficient and uh, something they can afford and afford to drive as opposed to saving the planet. I just don't think people in the 70s were thinking about saving the planet or yeah, the 80s. Yeah, you're probably right. We're going to the um, mid Cretaceous period now, John. Yeah, this this <laughs> chart takes us back. Remember where I showed you the 25 degrees as the temperature for the planet the, the yes. last 600 million years? That was kind of that was kind of constant. If we weren't in an ice age, you know, we kind of dipped down and came back. So this shows what the planet temperature on Earth looked like when the planet's temperature is 25 degrees. Remarkably, what this shows you is that the temperatures 
at the equator. The temperatures at mid latitudes were not much different than they are now. But what was very different was that the temperatures at the poles were much higher. There was no ice on the planet at the time. And so, so this suggests that basically, if there is in fact warming in some way, shape, or form, most likely that warming is going to happen at the poles, which is what we're actually seeing now. We're seeing more warming at, 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 the, at the higher latitudes than we're seeing at the equators. And, and you know, the 0.8 temperature degrees we've seen in the last 150 years, a lot of that's happened at higher latitudes. Mm -hmm. If you live in Canada, it might be a little bit warmer, for you, but it's still pretty damn cold up there. It hasn't melted much ice. It hasn't changed the temperature much there overall. But, but this is what we would expect to see if, there's, if there is runaway warming, like we're being told in the narrative. This is probably what it's going to look like. We are going to see some, some warmer conditions in Canada, Siberia. Maybe we'll see less ice up there. And maybe that will eventually drive a little more, little more um, uh, sea, sea level rise at that point. But, but for the most part, understanding this will, 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 will help us not have to worry so much about, you know, the quick temperature of the equator reaching 150 degrees or something silly. But John, earlier in the presentation, you did mention that people are very resistant to change. And so this, any kind of perceived change, even on this, even as, as, uh, as illustrated here, can be perceived as threatening to people. So that is that is somewhat well, understandable. Yeah, yeah. But I'm just saying if it were to change, which is extremely yes. unlikely, I mean, this this would be, this would, we'd have to be out of the ice age completely. Yes. We are still having these 100,000 year ice age like yes. glaciation periods. So that's terrifying to me. Actually. But it, it this puts the change in, in a context and a frame that makes it less Yeah, yeah, less it just scary. says that if, if it does warm up, this is gonna, how it's gonna warm up. Yes. It's gonna, it's gonna inflate the whole tire, not, not, not cause little bubbles in it, that, that, that cause, you know, you to be facing temperatures that are you know, crazy. This, this here is, is a representation of, of one of the satellite data uh, graphs. And this comes from the U of H satellite temperature data. And what we can see here very clearly, there are certain oscillations in temperature. We can see the El Nino, the El Nino, the Pacific Oscillation. And, the, you know, and, and we can see there's also some elements of, of the Atlantic Oscillation in here. But we see that over the last, uh, let's say over the last five years, there's been an El Nino and El Nino, an El Nino and El Nino cycle which means there was some heat warming in the Pacific and there's some cooling in the Pacific and you see that the temperature went high. Well, we were here at the same time that, 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 that global temperatures had never been hotter in 2016 and global temperatures had never been hotter in, in, 20, in 2019. But these are really extreme points in an oscillation. These weren't real representation points for global data. And so right now in the last four months, we are completely out of that oscillation. And whether that, 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 that number continues to go down or whether it goes up still remains to be seen. But, but, as, of, but as of June 2021, you see that, that uh, the average global temperatures are just cooler than they've been in a while. And we don't hear the media talking about this much, do we? <laughs> we hear them talking about you know, some, some extreme weather event, but we don't hear them talking about the fact that global temperatures are warmer now. And, and, and ideally, when they start talking about the coolest the temperatures have been and the hottest temperatures have been, this is the coolest it's been since 2000, 2011, it looks like. It could come down from here. So uh, this is what natural, natural processes do. The temperature goes up, it goes down, but it certainly uh, is nice when we have some reliable data that we can look at. Well, John, when I give you my presentation on death, I'll show you that the uh, death rate is lower now than it was in 2008, that we, oh, we spiked. Absolutely. In, in 2008, there was like super, we had a number of years where it was very high and it's been, yeah. death rate has steadily been declining. So yeah, it is interesting. Yeah, last year accepted, of course, but. but uh... I don't think last year was significantly higher. I haven't looked at the final numbers, but that was my, that's why I was looking at it. And it's, uh, it's just very interesting, the semantics of all the numbers and the, uh, the uh, the rates. Yeah. So we have our good friend Al Gore, who we don't hear from much anymore, but uh, he still has some material to present, I guess. Well, um, yeah. What what this is this is showing is 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 this used to be part of my narrative discussion, and it's a it's a clever slide because it's just so simple. Because this is the entire narrative all in one box here. Humans burn fossil fuels. CO two levels go up. 
temperature goes up. And that's the way he laid it out. That's the way he spelled it out, an inconvenient truth, which was broadcast to millions and millions of kids around the well, world. I mean, Al Gore, you know, he invented climate change just like he invented the internet, John. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> so I, I, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't really be challenged this. But if you look at the next graph, I think the next graph is a better representation of what actually happens. There's orbital, orbital variations, which are basically changes in the Earth's orbit, changes in the Earth's tilt, and changes in other, other variations of the way the Earth is depicted that also influenced by, by irradiation and insulation, the amount of solar radiation that falls on the Earth. And as those change happens, they drive changes in the temperature. And those changes in temperature impact, impact both the atmosphere as well as the sea and the oceans. And as the temperatures increase, you know, then as the oceans increase in particular, if, if the temperature goes up, they emit carbon dioxide. If the temperature of the ocean goes down, they absorb carbon dioxide. So this does show a relation between temperature and carbon dioxide. It's just exactly the opposite of what Al Gore said. Now it shows this little yellow liner, and this sort of says, yeah, CO2 is in fact a greenhouse gas. And there may in fact be some sort of very, very minor feedback from that, but it's not significant. And most of the time we've got solar radiation change or insulation changing temperature, which changes carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is just, it's, a, it's an indicator, but it's not really something that's gonna drive much warming. And this is a, this is a much better understanding of what's going on with our, with, our, with our climate right now. This is exactly what happened in Greenland and other places over the last 4,000 years, where climate change changed a lot because of all of these different variations. And uh, so I've got a couple more slides. And this one here is actually what CO2 looks like in Salt Lake City, Utah. And while I showed you the very clean graph that shows CO2 going up very cleanly from the volcano in the Pacific, when you actually measure it in a city, you see that in the wintertime, when, when, when plants are less active, you know, it could spike pretty high in a city. It can spike up to 500, you see here, you know, back in 2004, spike up to 500 in 2009. Also, you know, you see there's a, maybe a very, very slight trend line of what's happening here, but, but there's a lot more variability in CO2. But if you're in a room, and I saw this, this done one time, and you measured the CO2 of the room I'm sitting in right now, it's probably about 1,000. <laughs> Because of my breathing out, you know, I've emitted a lot of carbon dioxide. It's raised, it's raised the carbon dioxide in the room, and, and I don't have any any problems being in this room. So I don't think that the, this idea that CO two is a poison is. is I'm is a little confused bad. about the winter, though. So I would assume it'd be less plant life. So why is there higher levels? Because more is more is available. It's not being utilized by plants. Is that, is that how it works? Well, it's certain. Yeah, it's not being used by plants. There's just as many people, probably just as many animals. You know, so so. Uh, um, but the plants, the plants are what drive it down when when they're when they're when they're sucking it up. Like in okay. spring, so time. winter it rises because there's less less plants to absorb yeah, it. Yeah, 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 exactly. When spring hits, you know the carbon CO two levels come down. The plant growth Got occurs. It. Farmers yes. have a lot in their fields. Very interesting. This next, this next graph is from the same area. It's also from Salt Lake City over the same time period. And this stuff is from Willie Soon, a, a climate scientist that's been working with the Smithsonian. <laughs> the question, and his question is. Okay, we just seen that there are high CO2 levels in Salt Lake City. He's like, when you look at and look at this graph, where exactly does that look like there was any spike in temperature? Because he's only showing yes. the winter, he's only showing in winter temperatures here. And so you know, it's just kind of it's just kind of showing there's there's a randomness that's well, not reflected in CO2. Well, it's CO2 a fun rating. anomaly. It's a fun anomaly. So what it's saying is that when the carbon dioxide levels are highest, the temperature is the coolest. Well, or not necessarily, because when, they, when they're higher, it doesn't matter to temperature. Temperature doesn't care. Well, I would say with that, but if you want an anomaly, that show that, that chart shows that in wintertime, temperatures are cooler. At the same time, the carbon dioxide levels are the highest. So that's... that's well, well, exactly. Well, that's, yeah, exactly. And this shows that even, even among that, there's been no increase in temperature in the wintertime. So the fact that carbon dioxide levels may have increased very slightly in the last number of years hasn't led to a temperature change. But so and if so, you yeah. use their shaky science, you'd have to get rid of, we'd have to be on a campaign to get rid of winter, John. We need to just get rid of winter then, because winter must be the problem that's driving up. 
You're right. I guess there. I guess you, you, if you look at those high CO2 levels and the fact there's low temperature movement. I'm all for getting rid of winter here in Chicago. Yeah. Now this was just this was just another analysis that Willie soon did. And he sort of showed what insulation was doing as they measured it, and how did that look compared to what the temperature data was doing, and it corresponded pretty well. Because one of the things we hear from the people in the narrative a lot of times is that it must be carbon dioxide. What else could it be? Here's a simple answer: solar insulation. And and you know it's just it's just a, a another way to understand what the natural influence are that caused all the historical ups and downs we see in the temperature records. Well, I like now, the, the term solar. I like the term solar installation. I think that's a good one because that's thought provoking for people. Yep. Exactly. It's insulation, not insulation. In insulation. It's it's so it's, it's it's solar radiation impacting. Oh, air. insulation. Insulation. Yeah. The sea level's rising. Okay, so this is this is one of these arguments you you see sometimes in the media or various different various sources. They say that you know we had carbon dioxide that sort of kicked off 1950s, and we've got the sea levels rising. So therefore, you know, correlation means that carbon dioxide must be causing sea level rising. But what we don't necessarily see is what's on the next chart. And this is a matter of framing. So this is actually what's happened to temperature over the last 14,000 years, which, which is increased by about 120 meters. And so if you look at close to the zero there, that's, that's, that's recent times, the temperature level, the sea level rise here is really, really minor. And so, this this notion that that sea level rise is now unusual, and it's being caused by by human induced fossil fuels, isn't consistent with the record here, which means that a lot of the sea level rise has come from the end of the last glaciation when all that ice that was sitting about kind of melted and and receded, and we're not seeing anything very unusual in recent years. In fact, if you look at the next slide, we see that sea level rise may have in fact have slowed down. Toward the toward the end of the the end of the uh, the twentieth century, and so um, now the last slide. Yeah, I, I didn't cover extreme weather law. I talked about it a bunch, and this is tornadoes and hurricanes and drought and changes in snow cover and all this stuff. But when you look at these things long term, you see the same framing problem. Someone will show you like the last 15, 20 years. Say, oh, it's an increase. And then if you look at the last 60 years, you see it now, it's pretty, it's pretty standard, it's pretty common. <laughs> and so uh, you've got to kind of follow, got to follow the data because you know, there's nothing like lying with statistics. That's kind of what we've been seeing. So, so that kind of concludes my presentation. I spoke a little longer than, than you and I had talked about. John, you, you told me every, all my answers have been, all my questions have been answered, but except I still don't know if I should hold that barbecue this weekend or if I'm going to be rained out. So you're a terrible, you're a terrible weatherman but you're a great speaker on climate. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think you did a really good job. Well, really, thank you. you're too, you're really too kind. Thank you, thank you Stanley. And I appreciate it. I, I appreciate your, your perspective and your due diligence in, in tracking down all that information for us. So John, thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to talking to you again very, very soon. Thank you so much. Stanley, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Bye-bye.